Hi, I'm Eric Sitrenbaum with the BC COVID-19 Modeling Group, and this video is a walkthrough of some techniques that we use to keep track of COVID-19 variants. The original motivation for creating this video was a request from a colleague at UBC teaching a medical genetics course on emerging genomic topics for uh, the Genomic Counseling and Variant Interpretation Certificate Program. Hello, MidG595 students. Uh, but because we thought this might be of broader interest, we're making it public on our YouTube channel. So in this video, we're going to cover the following topics. We're going to talk about uh, nextstrain.org and how to use that to visualize COVID-19 genomic data, specifically uh, visualizing the virus's phylogeny and its clades. We're going to discover what international data on COVID-19 is available on GISAID and how to access it. We're going to look at publicly available tools for analyzing and visualizing genomic data. So that's uh, on covarnet.ca. We're going to learn how genomic data can provide estimates of variant fitness through the quantitative uh, notion of selective advantage. And finally, we're going to see how these data, when combined with estimates of infections, let's say cases or something equivalent to that, uh, can tell us which variants are of concern and how those might be growing. Here is an example of a visualization of um, the genomic data that we're going to uh, talk about in this video. Um, I'm not going to explain it. Instead, I'm going to um, rely on the expertise of my colleague, Sally Otto, who is also a member of the BC COVID-19 modeling group, as well as a, a colleague in the zoology department. So here is Sally explaining genomics of COVID-19 and its analysis. So since the start of the pandemic, scientists across the world have gathered data on the genomics of this virus and uh, developed some really amazing tools for sharing and visualizing that data. So NextStrain is, is an amazing visualization tool that provides a summary of the um, the pandemic at a genomic level. And this um, picture is a geometric um, description of the evolutionary tree. Each um, dot is a sample from a person who was sick with COVID, infected with this virus, and it sample date what is the is along this x-axis. And the um, branches between the various dots show how closely related those sequences are. If they have one mutational difference or two, they'll be very close together. If they have 10 mutational differences, they'll be very different. And it's color-coded at this point, it's color-coded by what we've come to name these sequences. Um, and these names, um, the orange and the yellow and the reds are the Omicron. You can see the previous sequences um, were, or previous viruses. This is an example of one that was a Delta, these light blues. And so um, since the start of the pandemic, we see um, uh, this kind of takeover of clades. I find it actually easier to see this, visualize this, if we make the tree more and turn it into a circle. And then we can see at the beginning of the circle was when the pandemic started. This circle starts in um, 2020, this is 2021, 2022, and outwards. And again, you can see the initial year of the um, virus in the first concentric circle um, did not help Omicron. It had a series of lineages um, eventually giving rise to alpha, then um, pretty soon after beta and gamma, then um, delta, and finally the Omicron series of sweeps that we see now. So we can visualize it in two ways. We can visualize it by time, or we can visualize it by divergence in terms of the number of mutations uh, that the virus sample differs from the original strain back at the beginning of, two, of the pandemic. And so this is 20 mutational differences, 40, 60, 80, out of about 30,000 base pairs in the whole um, genome of the virus. So one of the... Um, aspects that you can see is that over evolutionary time, the um, virus accumulates more and more mutations. 
It's actually easier to see when we've got lots of data vision op options here. Let's take a look at it and, and visualize how many mutational changes there are per collection date. So here at the beginning, when we collected the sequences, they were all very, very similar to the original strain with under 20 mutational differences. Um, and then by the time we got to a year um, into the pandemic, then there are more and more mutations accumulated. And you can see this rise over time in the number of mutations per unit time. Um, we also have noticed another interesting feature, which is that all of the um, variants of concern kind of um, rose above the original um, the original line, the, the um, mutations were accumulating. If you imagine a clock through these gray dots, it actually has a lower slope. And then all of a sudden, the variance of concern has a higher slope or a higher number of mutations. And then you can see it above here with Omicron. So the, these kind of pulses upwards in the number of mutations carried in the genome are very characteristic of these variants of concern. So, but you, you may realize there aren't enough dots on, on this uh, figure compared to the number of uh, um, cases, let alone the number, the number of cases that we sequenced, let alone the number of cases in the world. And it's really important to know that this next strain data visualization is just a sample of the many, many genomes that have been um, gathered to date. This says showing 2,900 genomes sampled between these dates. That's a very small minority. If you actually wanna do any statistical analyses, you have to download more of the data. The data itself um, in general across the world is um, sent to this Gisade um, uh, resource, which um, has the sequences to date. And of as of this date, there are over 12 million genome sequences that have been submitted to GSAID. Let me go ahead and log on. And that allows us to kind of dive in and see what's, what's happening. So we're going to look at the um, SARS-CoV-2 data. And let's start with a simple search. So a simple search, uh, we can um, see, we see all 12 million sequences to begin with, but we might be wanting to focus in on Canada, for example. And um, then we might want to say, well, what do we have in our database since the beginning of August? And today is the 23rd. So since the beginning of August, we have 2000 viruses that have been sequenced and this is that was collected from an individual um, since the 1st of August. And it's in this database by now. And there are 2,109 samples like that. We can just click on one and get more information about it. So this is the sample, the virus name, including a sample ID. Um, the the GSADA um, assigns it a unique identifier. It is the type of virus it is, is a beta coronavirus. Within the larger phylogeny or evolutionary tree, it's called GRA. That GRA clade is the Omicron clade. Within the Omicron clade, it has a specific name um, designated by the Pango group. Pango um, lineage designations are nicknames for the different parts of the tree of more related sequences. And this particular sample is a BA5.2.1. It then goes and tells us all of the amino acid substitutions in that particular um, individual. This means that it has a mutation in the spike gene and the amino acid was a change from A to S at the 27th site in the spike gene. So it tells you things, information like that, what amino acid changes it has, where, where it was collected from. This one's from Ontario, from a female of age 74. It then also gives the actual sequence, the ACTGs of the 30,000 base pairs, um, which you can download and analyze if you want. The ends are uh, places where it was unable to sequence, um, characterize that sequence of that virus. So this is a pretty good one. It has a, a not too many ends and, and lots of information. So that's true for every single um, clade, but there's a lot to download. What I often go to are the download section and it allows you to, to download a whole bunch of kind of pre-processed analyses. It can allow you to download all of the sequence data, 
that's the fast day data. The metadata is more like which pango lineage was it, when, when and where was it sampled from, et cetera. Um, and I tend to use this per clade. Like if I wanna do all of the sequences or all of the metadata from the Omicron clade, then I can say by clade, I'm gonna go in and download all of the GRA clade, which I mentioned before was the Omicron data. So that's what I do. And that gives me this tar file that's slowly downloading. And when I open it up, I will get the information about um, all of the Omicron sequences throughout the world. So at that point, once I've downloaded from Gisade, I do some pre-processing um, to focus in on the samples that are from Canada. And I also um, sort them out by province so I can um, analyze them. So I have the, the, in particular, I'm interested in which lineage, was it a BA1, a BA2, or what have you? Um, and what was the date of collection? Um, and where, which province was it collected in? So I pre-process all of that information using R, and I'm just visualizing it this way. At that point, we can monitor how the virus spreads over um, time. I'm going to show you, visualize this um, using a package that I and other colleagues have developed um, across Canada to, to, to visualize what is happening. This particular notebook or portal, um, here is the link to it, is nice because it has both the R code, the R code is available, um, as well as more of the methodology if you want to follow up. The data analyzed here is actually not from Gisade, but from a Canadian specific portal, the VirusSeq data portal that has the sequences from Canada and a little bit more data, for example, whether there were travelers or not, and how those sequences were obtained, which provides us with additional information. Let's go into the notebook itself. There are important caveats and disclaimers that are worth highlighting here. The sequences that are in the database aren't a random sample of cases. In fact, these days, very few people are getting PCR tested. And if they're not PCR tested, they're not going to be genome sequenced. Only the PCR tested, the officially tested cases are going to be in this database. So it's going to be biased towards those people that are still being tested, not, a, not the rapid antigen test taken at home. And here you can get the code if, um, if you to visualize this further, but this is just showing um, recently in the past year, how many sequences are of the various of, um, major um, subtypes. You can see this is the BA5 recent wave that we've been having. Then before that, this is BA2 and BA1, the two BA1 types. You can toggle this and show it in different ways. You can show it in terms of, um, just a basic or see the percentage of each strain. Importantly, these aren't necessarily, um, the height of these peaks aren't necessarily proportional to the number of cases. That's just proportional to the number of sequences in the database. So uh, we can also draw a phylogeny, a phylogeny relating the particular sequences found in Canada. We have a table that um, shows all of the mutational differences, kind of compacts those amino acid differences that are characteristic of the Canadian versus global BA2, BA4, and BA5. And you can also see, uh, even though BA1 is the pango lineage name for the um, larger group, you can also see the subtypes of BA1. And you can see how they are rising in frequency or declining in frequency over time. And that's uh, as time passes, each of these lineages evolves, as we can see by these multicolored graphs. Um, and let's like a look at the most recent one, BA5. Um, these are in terms of overall numbers, and this is in terms of percentage. I don't worry about large changes like this at the beginning. It's just reflecting very few numbers. But you can see more recently that there are some groups that are growing in, um, in frequency. BA 5.2.1 is growing in frequency over time, and those are the kinds of things that we watch out for. You can just eyeball this and see um, types that are growing in frequency, but it's better to actually do that more rigorously. And um, in this package, we estimate selection 
on the various subtypes as shown in the following graphs. So selection is an evolutionary concept of which um, measures the relative growth rate or relative fitness between two types, in this case, between two viral types, or three or four, or however many you're measuring. These graphs show how quick, how the frequency of BA4 and BA5 has changed over time relative to BA2 in the population of these Omicron strains. We want to estimate selection. How do we do that? I wanted to just show you the result that you'll get if you take your data, and this data is the frequency on a particular date of, say, um, BA4 or BA5 in the population. And then to that, we estimate these models of evolution, which um, track those frequencies over time using um, an estimate of the selective advantage of each type. And when we fit the models, we find in this particular case that BA4 has a uh, roughly 8% selective advantage per day over BA2, while BA5 has a 10 to 11% selective advantage. What does that mean? In this um, package, you can um, scroll down and figure out more of what's going on. Let's hit the selection graph. And this um, gives you more information about what the equations are we use to um, infer what's happening as these genome frequencies change over type time. So if you are tracking the frequency of one type, let's say it's BA, BA5, that's the ith type, then you're going to have some starting frequency at time zero. And over time, it's going, it's expected to change according to the, um, the, it's, it's selective advantage S and time. So if S is zero, then this is all going to be one and you're at the initial frequency. But as, uh, um, if S is positive, then it will grow over time or shrink over time. And this bottom, it, uh, just make sure our frequency is sum to one at every point in time. So what does S mean? An S, a positive S means that it's rising in frequency. A negative S means that it's declining in frequency. And just as a rule of thumb, a selection coefficient of 0.1 implies that that subtype is expected to rise from a frequency of 10 to 90% in 44 days. So this is pretty fast and that's the type of strong selection we've been seeing with um, BA5 over BA2, BA2, for example. We saw even higher selective advantages of BA of Omicron in the beginning over Delta. If this is the expected frequency over time, um, we can also use statistical techniques to estimate these. Un what's unknown is the selection coefficient. We don't know that. And we don't actually know the initial frequency of the type. We can measure it. We can estimate it. But typically what we do is estimate all of those unknowns in a likelihood framework. The likelihood of our seeing the genomic data on any particular day t is equal to the probability that we see sample a sequence of type I raised to the number of sequences of type I that are observed. And we do that over all types I and so and all time T. And that is going to be the likelihood we saw all of our genomic data that we were analyzing. And by maximizing this likelihood, we can find what are the best combination of S's and P's that would be most consistent with the data that we observed. And that is how, with some more technical details, how we estimate these selection coefficients, both um, across the board. We, well, you can also look by province. Some provinces are lacking data. Some have more data. So some, some cut off earlier, some don't. And you can also look within subtypes. Um, so let me scoot to the, to the BA5 subtype this is really useful and it's up, uploaded, fair, updated fairly regularly. It allows us to see within the BA5s whether there are types that are decreasing or increasing in frequency. So even within BA5, we're seeing further evolution. In particular, um, uh, BA5.2.1 has been spreading at a slightly higher rate. This selection coefficient, a little bit obscured here, is 3%. So that's not a major difference. And in fact, if you look across the board, there are no BA5 lineages that are, are really out, um, uh, outgrowing in any of the others. This BF lineage is growing slightly faster. 
And before I end, I'll just point out that sometimes those B, the names get so long, like this BF, I think was BA5.3.1.1, they just rename it. And that's where the BFs and BEs come from. All right. It, the other thing we can do with this data, once we know the free, how the frequencies are changing, it's kind of nice because we have, if, if we have, any estimate for what has been happening to case numbers. Here we're using case numbers in those individuals over 70 because we think that age group is more consistently tested. Or you could use wastewater data or any other data for what you think the trends are for case numbers over time. We can combine that with these evolutionary models for the um, change in frequency of the various subtypes. And that allows us to see um, what is kind of under the hood and driving particular waves that we're seeing in a population. In particular, we can see things like we did back in June, where even though we were coming off a BA2 wave and there was declines in case numbers overall, it, BA5, this one particular subtype was growing so much faster. Um, it, it had something like a 10, 11% selective advantage that it was actually not declining despite the fact that BA2 was declining in absolute numbers. And in terms of public health, this is the most important information. It allows us to find these points in time where there's kind of a disconnect between what we see in the overall case numbers and what's actually happening to the variants that are under the hood. So um, that we can draw these pictures for the different provinces by combining this kind of which variants are present and how fast are they growing and combining that with data on the case numbers over time. Now, just let me recap uh, what we've talked about. Um, so uh, we looked at how to use nextstrain.org to visualize genomic data. Uh, we also saw how, uh, how to access COVID-19 genome data on GISAID. Um, we looked at uh, some publicly available tools for analyzing and visualizing that data. And we saw uh, the, the concept of selective advantage and how we could use the analysis um, discussed there to determine what's actually going on. Even if we don't have direct estimates of number of cases of each variant, we can actually back that out from the analysis discussed here in combination with some kind of an estimate of infection. So I hope this has been useful and gives you more insight into some of the work that we've done and uh, makes a little bit more sense of uh, the reports that um, we've been producing over the last two years.